close our opening uh, session, our sort of longer inter introductory session, which I think was very meaningful. And we will go into our first panel discussion. And I'd like to just quickly introduce uh, the facilitator of that session, uh, Her Excellency, Madame Sanida Messi. She is the, was the former Deputy Prime Minister of Albania. She was also actively involved in the early planning of this event from the first meeting. In fact, this idea of no peace without women came from her brain, and <laughs> mind and heart. And um, she is a development economist. She is uh, part of the UN SDSN, which is the Sustainable Development Solutions Network of the Western Balkan Leadership Council. She's uh, involved in sustainable finance at the EU Commission. She is an expert there. Very, very happy to welcome to you and I pass everything over to you, Sinida. Thank you, dear. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really pleased and happy to join you, not today, but uh, to be working together with you since a couple of months to really build up uh, this kind of um, um, event. And I'm really happy to join all the speakers and panelists and everybody really, really to talk in this important moment about the peace, conflict resolutions, and what's the role of women into um, uh, this important issue. Into the panel that we are going to discuss, it's like uh, our theme as creating conditions for peace and development. As a developing economist, I always uh, thought that uh, definitely we need to have a culture of peace and uh, no conflict uh, in order to really invest in health, in education, and to have sustainable growth. And with all uh, my um, speakers in this panel, we'll try to give uh, their examples, their experience, and probably to um, make um, a summary of uh, their lesson learned and to serve not only to our network, but even to um, others uh, or other network we are working with uh, actually. Uh, let me introduce the marvelous panel that uh, we are having today. Um, together with me is Dr. Sakina Jacobi, founder, executive director of Afghan Institute of Learning. Uh, Dr. Sakina is the, um, uh, is the executive uh, director of Afghani Institute of Learning, which she founded in 95 in response to the lack of education and healthcare that the Afghan people were facing after decades of war and strife. Uh, since its founding, uh, the Afghani Institute of Learning uh, has been worked directly or indirectly and has impacted the lives of millions of Afghans, especially women and girls. Together with us today is a Dr. Ingeborg Brains, former a director, Women of Culture Peace Program, UNESCO in Norway. Uh, Dr. Ingeborg actually serves as a um, senior advisor to the Permanent Secretariat of the Nobel Peace Prize. She, uh, during her all life experience, she has been working a lot with um, women and gender, and especially to the Culture of Peace Program Directory in the um, UNESCO office in Islamabad. And uh, she served as UNESCO liaison officer in Geneva. And in that time, she recommended even the International Men's Day. So why not? Uh, we have a man uh, uh, in our panel today. I'm very happy, happy that uh, Marcus Lazen, a senior advisor, deputy chief peace building fund in the UN United States, joined to us. She, uh, he has been working for a long time in conflict resolution and in humanitarian work, working for the former Department of International Development with the UK, actually Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, PCDO department. Uh, he acts as a humanitarian counselor in, uh, on behalf of a UK mission in Geneva. He leads uh, conflict in, uh, resolution in Nigeria. He worked previously with UNDP and GIZ, and he worked on a lot of countries like Balkans, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, Guatemala, Peru, etc. Together with us is Dr. Teresa Komodini Kasia, a friend uh, of mine. She used to work and to be a politician. She used to um, be a member of European Parliament during 2014 and 17. 
Uh, actually, uh, she is a professor of law, University of Malta, and she's a very well-known uh, human rights lawyer and always uh, giving legal advisory or even um, being and serving as an uh, advocate for um, different and important um, uh, themes and the human rights uh, um, conflicts. And uh, uh, despite uh, all her work, she has been working even with the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And I'm happy that she is together with us here so she can um, tell her insights and experience and uh, probably even the case law that she's actually working now. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, for a brief introduction, if you can share with us your thoughts and ideas about the peace and development just in a small round of one or two minutes. And then I would like to give the floor to Mr. Marcus because um, he needs just um, to leave maybe in, uh, five, in 10, 15 minutes. So I'm asking for your permission that he will start first and then we can go on then later on with our discussion. So without losing any time, please, um, Dr. Sakina Jacobi, floor is, um, is yours. Doctor, please uh, unmute the microphone. We could, we cannot hear you. Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. It is a great honor to be here today in this event and with uh, such a wonderful, wonderful leader and uh, such a wonderful uh, human being who are really care for the um, part of the world that they are not able to care for themselves especially WFPW, uh, FP have been a, a one of my favorite organization who is really working for humanitarian. And what a topic, no peace without women. As a woman who have been living in a conflict zone for many, many years, 31 years I have been working in this area, women have been the victim everywhere. And so today we are going to discuss this and I am so happy to be able to be part of this discussion and be able to see if find the way to we can bring a solution for this problem. And always we talk about, uh, yes, there is war, there is a conflict, this and that, but how we can get around and as a woman, we can bring peace into these area that is constantly or suffering with war and conflict. Thank you. I just wanted to say only one few words and then we will have a discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ingeborg. I would like to hear some uh, initial thoughts from your part as well. Thank you. Honorable organizers, speakers, participants, and friends, I would like to express my deep appreciation to the conveners of this conference for providing a platform to discuss and search for peaceful and durable solutions to conflicts. It is vital in the dark and polarized times we are experiencing now to be practically solution oriented. Courageous women have over the centuries used their creativity and their caring capacity to help build peaceful, nonviolent societies. The first woman Nobel Peace Laureate, Bertha von Suttner, wrote in her famous anti-war book, Lay Down Your Arms, that we need, and I quote, to develop an active disgust for war. Today, we are in the middle of a war in Europe, and a series of wars are raging also elsewhere. Each time that we allow weapons and hatred to take the upper hand, when we let the hawks be our spokesperson, both humanity and humanism are losing. With modern weapons, war is an existential threat, not only to humanity, but itself on this, our beautiful planet. War kills and maims creates misery, destroys infrastructure, livelihoods, and the environment, and send millions on the run. War is obsolete and should be left in the dustbin 
of history. Like Eleanor Roosevelt said in the UN, nobody won the last war and nobody will win the next. The world spends present more than $2 trillion a year on the military, according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which correspond to more than 600 yearly regular UN budget. If we want the UN system to be able to do its work, we must move the money from the military to meet people's needs. Imagine only eight days of the world military expenditure would give 12 years free quality education for all the children of the world. Friends, we have work to do. Thank you. Thank you, dear, very much for your uh, insights and, uh, and message. Uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Marcus Lenzer, the Deputy Chief Peace Building Fund. Um, Mr. Marcus, are you online with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me well? Right. Yeah, very. Yeah, we can hear you very well. I know that um, you need to enter in another meeting soon enough, so the floor is yours. So you can share more than the two minutes of introduction, and probably if you are able to join us in the further discussion, we are much more than happy to come you back. Very well. No, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is really a great pleasure on this extremely important topic to be able to join you from the part of the Peace Building Fund here in New York. Again, apologies uh, of, of my curtailed time. Now, as you know, the high level week is upon us and it is already very busy here in New York. And my, my uh, Assistant Secretary General for Peace Building Support has asked me to join her with another high level visitor. But I really wanted to still be here because this topic is so important. The title says it all, there is no peace without women. I think the colleague from UN Women earlier and my colleagues who have just spoken before me have already put it super eloquently of why this matters. What I would like to add, maybe um, starting from actually immediately the point um, uh, the doctor made just now on the financing. I of course work for a fund, it's a UN system-wide fund that was created in 2005 at a time when the membership already realized that we really needed to have a, a step change if we wanted to make peace and international efforts to support it last longer beyond sort of peacekeeping operations. And of course, in 2016, we had resolutions, the sustaining peace resolutions that the Security Council and the General Assembly uh, adopted that recognized that peace building is not something that just starts uh, after a violent conflict ended. Um, we heard in terms of the role of women that we have um, from the video that you and women showed how that we have evidence that peace uh, works better, lasts better when women are meaningfully involved. But the funding is not the only thing. Money is not the only thing that matters, but it, it does talk and it does set incentives. And the way we fund and the quality of funding really makes a difference. Let me give you the example here. Uh, on one hand, we know that every year when there's a report on the status of the Women Peace Security Resolution, that it is that we are not making enough progress on the commitments in the resolution, and that uh, the support of meaningful engagement of women at all levels of peace process remains underfunded. This fund that I work for has taken that to heart and really prioritized um, the issue, not only women's uh, meaningful engagement, uh, and empowerment in peace building and for peace building, but gender responsive uh, peace building generally. Because as we know, in order to make um, the role of women uh, count better, men have to change their behaviors and attitudes. So that is important too. What does this mean in terms of financing? The Secretary General has asked the whole UN system to commit throughout and everything that we do as the UN, at least 15% of budgets to gender responsive anything really in the whole development sector. We thought, okay, we can do even more and we need to do more in peace building. So the target for our fund is twice this, that we invest at least 30% of everything that we fund in gender responsive peace building and that all our recipient agencies, you had women is a very important one, but also UNDP, UNICEF, the World Food Program, the whole lot of UN agencies we work with, it matters in all of them and we all hold them to this. 
And in fact, we're very proud that we are constantly exceeding this target at the moment. Last year, it was 40%, 47% of our investments went to gender responsive peace building. So I think that really matters in order to respond to some of the shortcomings that our colleagues already refer to, but it is not enough. This fund is not adequately resourced. Um, and I think my colleague gave really good statistics to you already um, of, of, of what the discrepancy is in terms of expenditure on military as opposed to peace building. And I think um, just to conclude with a few points from my experience of you know, why, why does it matter so much? Colleagues have already mentioned a number of things that I don't want to repeat. So for me, it is um, emphasizing the role of women in peace building, and, but also again, changing the behavior of men in this regard matters so much because it makes a qualitative difference. It is about uh, the transformational power of peace building. And that range, uh, ranges from issues related to justice. The example that my UN Women colleague gave on the Sepulsaka case in Guatemala, I think is a very powerful one. And that shows both that it takes time that we have to keep on investing in these issues long after a peace agreement has been signed, because sometimes the real transformation comes only a generation later and we still need to support it and engage. And this was a very powerful story that in fact, the Peace Building Fund was very proud to have supported. It is about livelihoods. It is about um, making sure, you know, the deputy prime minister is an economist. So when war ends and we have had long periods of where particularly women and children are typically the ones that suffer the most time and time again, but also take then a long time uh, after a war ends to actually be brought back into more opportunities, also economic and livelihood opportunities. It's important for peace dividends to reach them. And we have some really powerful examples in Colombia, for example, that after the peace accord was reached to really go into the regions that were um, so marginalized from the economy and help bring also businesses back into the areas that, that don't do what they always do, but really work with women entrepreneurs and to the point that projects we've supported. Um, and today we've gotten so far that you can uh, buy coffee from women cooperatives that we supported in areas that were previously so neglected. So the justice aspect of the economic empowerment and livelihood aspects, and then what colleagues have already uh, mentioned in terms of the, the leading role of women and the meaningful participation. Let me end on one important point. We, we have been investing in this for a while. We still have to do better. We are trying to learn. Last year, together with UN Women and other partners, we commissioned a thematic review of our support to gender responsive peace building over the last five years. And the review is available online. It has a lot of important lessons. And one of the ones is what colleagues have already spoken to. Often we now are better at getting uh, more women into the room, but that in and of itself isn't enough. It has to be meaningful. And we have to make sure that this is really accounted for. So the quality of the processes. Um, and again, it's not about other people talking on behalf of women. We, it's, the colleague before me um, gave extremely powerful examples of how much. And I think it matters because women so often are able to speak again about the qualitative changes, the transformative changes that need to take hold for peace to be meaningful and last. And we are really uh, proud to be supporting this and to work with so many partners across the UN system and civil society to keep supporting this. So thank you for having us here and letting me share these uh, reflections. Thank you, dear, very much for sharing all of this uh, information. And definitely when you were mentioning the 50% gender target, I was thinking of 30. Now that you already are surpassing the 30%, then uh, definitely the next target will be 50%. So, you know, pure, pure, pure equality. And um, yes, we all do agree that uh, the war is costing much more than prevention of the conflict and uh, helping in education and, um, and health as well. So thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you'll have um, time to really um, get in again. If yes, so please, uh, please do it. Uh, I would like to give the, the floor to um, uh, my friend, um, a marvelous person. Uh, she's a lawyer from Malta. And um, dear series, I would like to have your inputs um, in the theme and uh, not only, but uh, according to your experience, what about the conflicts and how we can um, 
um, how we can work in even early stages about the conflicts, not going directly to, to, to war and how this will have development as well. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sanida. Thank you for your lovely comments. And um, um, I'm honored to be here. Um, so, dear excellencies, um, I think what I'll be doing today is really sharing my experiences. I entered politics as a human rights advocate because I was already a human rights lawyer before I joined politics. And I actually left politics because I could not stop being a human rights advocate. And uh, this is what has shaped um, the comments that I'll be sharing with you today. So I think despite several elections that uh, we have taken for peace, we still continue to be faced with conflict. We do coin concepts such as peace and human security to express very noble aims. And as human beings, we know where we want to be. We know that we need to achieve well-being. But if we listen closely to political rhetoric, it becomes very clear that whatever policy politicians are trying to promote, they do sell it by addressing some aspect of that well-being, be, be it an aspect of well-being that is positive for humankind or not. So we see war being sold by the aggressor as a path to national greatness. This, the direct consequence of this is the devastation of another people. This is, for example, the Russia's, Russia's war on Ukraine. We also see state control over people's lifestyles, over how people connect with each other and relate to one another, being sold as protection of one group of people over another. So for example, the taking over of Afghanistan and its consequences on women. We see children, women and men left to die at sea as a consequence of that legal disregard that authorities exercise with much impunity, which is fed by racism, and the monstrous us and them mentality. So while following a rhetoric in favor of peace, I feel that politicians often benefit from creating conflicts and from feeding already existing conflicts. And this is because the system of politics that appears to have taken roots in most of our societies is one which focuses on the today rather than on the tomorrow. Becoming a country's administrator to administer for the benefit of the people of that country, as people who are part of a global population, is often diminished to a mere struggle to the top echelons of power for power itself. I think that when the international community, when the United Nations, for example, seeks the commitment of politicians to work towards peace, conflict, prevention, and human security, it does so with the belief that the population of any territory is part of the family of the global population. It does so in the understanding that we are one people, irrespective of our race, ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, religion, or any other status of the individual. We are, at the end of the day, one population. And as one population, when one of us as a national collective makes the wrong decision, then we all as a global collective are affected. We have struggled for years to understand that climate change is a global problem that requires a global response. Now that means that it has taken us years to even recognize that we share the same house. It is still a struggle to get national policymakers, legislators and politicians to accept that we as a people share the same house, the same home, and that consequently, the actions of one will affect us all. If this is still a struggle, then no wonder we are still struggling with attaining peace, development, and human security. In politics, I have found that we often speak at the people rather than with the people. In politics, I have found that we often act cowardly, because we are aware that the right decisions, the decisions taken in the global public interest, may cause contempt towards policymakers at home. The global public interest may be seen as conflicting with the national public interest, because it may have economic, social or political consequences, which are more burdensome on one national territory than another. 
Yet at the end of the day, there can be no peace if we continue to think of fiefdoms as if countries and hence their populations are greater and grander if they can stand alone rather than stand together with other countries and other populations. We speak of individual human rights, I think, because these are the basic standards that create an enabling environment for a person to develop as a human being. States indeed po boast of how their legislation protects human rights, yet at the same time continue to fail to provide an enabling environment for those rights to be enjoyed. We have numerous international systems trying to protect the individual from human rights violations. Because although well-being may mean different things to different people, as a global community, we understand that there will be no basic well-being and no human security, unless at least these human rights standards are enjoyed by all. Yet we also live at a time when two very important watchdogs are continuously being disabled rather than enabled. I speak of journalists and of civil society. In Europe, we witnessed the assassination of Jan Kruczak and Defne Caruana Galizia. In Russia, we are witnessing a complete shutdown of independent journalism. In Tunisia, we see activists and journalists prosecuted for expressing their views. In Turkey, we are seeing the blacklisting of journalists. In Iran, we have death sentences for LGBTQI activists. In Ukraine, we see journalists killed on the front line as was Shireen Abu Akleh in Palestine, and so many more examples of instances where power is in conflict with democracy, where the underlying conflict is that of controlling the message, information, and debate. Really, a war waged by power over those who won't remain silent when faced with human suffering, bad governance, abuse of power, and other negative human actions that corrupt the global well being. I strongly believe that we need to reclaim democracy, rule of law, and good governance as the foundations upon which we can recognize each other as equal participants in a global population striving for human well being. But to reclaim human well being and consequently human rights, we need to strengthen journalists and civil society. In my opinion, they need to regain their position as pillars of democracy and pillars of the people, not only where democracy is formally already established, but is faltering, but also where democracy is only still a dream. Journalists and civil society need to be supported as the engine to regenerate societies, as they help us to recalibrate the balance between individual states and the global community and between national states and citizens. In my mind, we cannot reach human security and peace unless our societies are enriched by strong independent journalists and activists. Their role to challenge us with information, with different perspectives, with new ideas. Their role is to help us look inwards and challenge us to be better. I believe that without providing a global enabling environment for journalists and activists, which will then spread into national environments, we will remain chasing somewhat ambiguous forms of peace and human security, which won't be built around the person as a person equal one to the other. One on a day when we discuss how to reach peace, we simply cannot fail to ask how do we strengthen, support and enable journalists and civil society? How do we enrich societies irrespective of whether they stand on the irrespective of where they stand on the democracy scale by giving journalists and civil society their rightful place as pillars of society? I think when we manage to effectively claim a safe position for journalists and activists, then I believe we would be a step closer to peace and human security, and also a step closer to ensuring gender equality. I think. This is my contribution so far, Senida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Doctor. I'm really uh, happy to hear that um, you mentioned even the media freedom and how much important is um, the media freedom, but even the activism in general into the fragile democracies we are facing, actually. 
Uh, I would like to give the floor to um, Dr. Brains. Um, um, I read a lot about you and your experience as peace educator is amazing. At the same time, um, um, you have been working and uh, co-authoring or authoring, but even editing a lot of uh, books and a lot of papers in terms of um, uh, culture of peace, gender equality, disarming or peace education. Uh, your experience is huge and I'd love to hear and to invite you to share uh, what can be some of the good examples you can share with us that will serve us as a role models and that we need much more to amplify. I mean, what is working and what is not working actually. And I think that you are the right person to tell and uh, according to your experience and being so wise and mature, I think um, your input is uh, it's very much helpful in this, in this time that we are living. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I wish, of course, that we had much more time. So in such a short while, it's not possible to share that many experiences. But I think that we all agree that we live in a world in an unprecedented, that is unprecedentedly complex and unsettling with a very threatening and rapidly evolving climate and environmental crisis with modernization of nuclear weapons and fast growing inequality gaps, which create poverty, starvation, and anger. We simply have neither time nor money to spend on militarized security. We need to rethink the very concept of security and concentrate our resources on cooperation instead of competition on building respect and understanding instead of making enemy images of the others and demonizing them. Women in the East and in the West, in the North and in the South may join hands and lead the way. People claim human security, such as food security and clean air and water. The COVID-19 pandemic showed us that nobody is safe unless everybody is safe. The same pertains to international relations. A new report on common security developed inter alia by the International Peace Bureau underlines the importance of building trust between people avoiding suspicion over borders. When confronted simultaneously with multiple existential crises, we have to look ahead and give a vision to the future that we would like to see. Like UNESCO, the UN Organization for Education, Science and Culture did end of last century with its groundbreaking vision of a cultural peace. The cultural peace was defined as the values, attitudes, and behavior that reject violence and endeavor to prevent conflicts by addressing their root causes with a view to solving problems through dialogue and negotiation. The cultural peace concept encompasses not only peace as the absence of war, but focuses on the content and the conditions of peace. The end of the former Cold War gave wings to the culture of peace program. Some 75 million people signed the UNESCO Manifesto 2000, committing themselves to, and I quote, respecting all life, reject violence, share with others, listen to understand, preserve the planet, and rediscover solidarity. The Women and the Peace, Cultural Peace Program, which I was happy to head, encouraged women's initiatives for peace, helped empower women for participation in political processes, and counteract patriarchal structures, hegemonic masculinity, and male violence. 
the statement which was made to the Fort Well Conference on Women underlined the intimate link between gender equality, development, and peace. The war on terror, however, following the 11th September 2001 attacks in New York entailed a serious setback to a cultural peace. Fear and the fight against terror came to dominate both the international discourse and the use of resources. Since then, the world's peace and disarmament structure and agreements have been seriously weakened. Today, it would be important to link the culture of peace thinking with the Paris Agreement on Climate and the UN Agenda for Sustainable Development. That would give substance and new energy, not least to Sustainable Development Goal 16 on peaceful societies and to SDG 47 on education for a culture of peace, global citizenship and the environment. Since war begins in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defenses for peace must be constructed, is stated in the preamble to UNESCO's constitution. And I think we agree again, learning to live peacefully together is among the most important pedagogical and political challenges to us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for connecting the peace and uh, together with the UN agenda with the SDGs, especially the number four, the number 16, which is education and, uh, and living in peace, but definitely connecting even with the, one of the, I think, the biggest crisis that we are ever living, the climate crisis as well because the climate crisis will generate or can generate much more uh, conflict uh, as well. I really appreciate the idea that always when we talk about uh, war, we think that the, um, the, uh, the, the, contrary, the contrary of war is, um, is, is peace. And um, you mentioned the fact that uh, not necessarily peace is the absence of war. We need much more to live in peace and to uh, live and to accept um, uh, each other as well. So thank you very much for sharing this with us. Last but not least, uh, I have here an amazing woman which is working since a long time, uh, since uh, even before that she founded the 1995, um, her learning institute, but working with the communities, uh, working directly with youth, working directly with women in one of the most, um, uh, I don't know, long term, I think, uh, conflict, uh, conflict area. Dr. Jacobi, uh, what can you share with us? What are um, really your, um, uh, what is really your impact um, in, uh, in Afghanistan, but not only, what lessons can we learn um, out of that? And um, uh, can you share please uh, the role of education in building a peace and helping people not simply to have better education, but uh, beyond that to grow and maybe to keep and to maintain the culture um, of peace and fight uh, or strive for conflict resolution as well. Thank you very much. I really appreciate our colleagues um, input, um, especially that um, one of my colleagues says that she is uh, talking about her experience, and I would like to share about my experience working uh, in a conflict zone, working during the time that I was working in the refugee and until now that I am working in Afghanistan. Um, my experience uh, working in area of education has been is the most important objective of my life. Why? I am sure a lot of people are asking why education, and as all of you know, education is a, uh, is a topic that is really connect um, uh, with health and with poverty. And if you really try to work the root of those issues, and that is, you know, why there is conflict, why there is uh, war. Because people are fighting because they are poor. People are angry because they are not equal. Pe people are fighting because they are don't know better than just being united. They, they are ignorance. And so, and if you combine like a triangle, if you connect education, poverty, and health together, 
and you try to reach out for those, then it's a long process. It's not the easy process. It's not the short process, but sure enough, it will have the impact. And sure enough, through experience, I have been working for 31 years right now in area of education and health. For this 31 years, I have seen the women of Afghanistan, the girls of Afghanistan that improve tremendously from where they started. They become the leader, they become the, the, the uh, parliament member, they become the teacher, they become the doctor, the engineer, that the world was shocked from their progress. But that is not enough because what happened to Afghanistan is as soon as we built the system, as soon as we get instructed, then again, the system collapsed, somebody else will take over, and then we have to start again from zero point. And then we start and then we built again, and then it collapsed. My point is here that the people who are suffering the most or the vulnerable one or the women and children. Right now, the children of Afghanistan are malnourished. They are 5 million children are dying from hunger. And also the women of Afghanistan are dying of malnourished and sickness. And most of the service that it was available for them, they are not there anymore. 260 hospital and clinic has been closed. The educational system is completely collapsing. Why? Because there is most of the teacher also is left. And the one who are there, they are not really updated. And also the schools are not open. The girls' schools are closed from 7 to 12. So it is a chaos situation in Afghanistan. But at the same time, Afghanistan has been falling out of the radar. Everybody talking about education, everybody talking about the woman is getting education, but nobody is thinking that right this moment they have to get education. Education cannot wait. And for that purpose, I just want to share with you that in a country that is a traditional country, in a country that is, has a different uh, culture, in a country that it has a different belief, in a country that almost 90% of the people are not educated, how you are going to really expect people come and stand up and defend themselves for their right? How do you expect people come and say, okay, I want to be democratic? How do you expect the people to come and say, I have this company or that company or I'm doing business? People are starving. There is no job available. People are not educated. People are traditional. So it means that education is the key issue for Afghanistan, for every country. A developing country, but specifically for Afghanistan. I really believe that if we want to bring peace in any nation, first you have to really educate that civil society that they can speak for themselves, not somebody else speak. My colleagues put it very well that she said that the politicians are using this issue right now for their own benefit. The politician should talk with the people, not to the people. The politicians are not doing that. The politicians should provide services for those people, but they are not doing. They are providing service for themselves, but they are believe in what they can uh, are capable to do and speak out about it. I am not a politician. I am not an activist also. I'm an educationalist, but I believe that you can provide activist information if you educate the civil society. You can call all you want to about the all kinds of constitution, all kinds of law, all kinds of democracy, if the civil society are not aware of it, if the civil society is not responsible, if the civil society doesn't have integrity, if the civil society doesn't have love and unity together and they don't see equality, how you expect them to respond to this? My point is that learn how to work with civil society, learn to work how to according to their needs, not to you go and implement something else and give them something that they don't believe in it. How AIL has been working, I want to share with you. We have been working on that every single system so far, and we have not been closed. Many people are asking me why you are not burned, why you are not closed, why? Are... Because we work as a local organization, we work with local people. We believe in equality. 
we believe in those poor people who doesn't have a voice, or poor people who cannot go in a meeting and sit and talk, and a poor woman that who are inside her compound, suffocating inside her compound. We go door to door, we go community after community, and we relate to the people. And once you relate to the people, the people believe in you, then you teach them what they need according to their needs. And once you teach them according to their needs, they grow and they develop and they produce more and more and more. And that is what we are doing. It is not an easy task. It is not simple. It is not fast, but it takes time. You know that through my time for 31 years, I have seen young women grow to be a fantastic leader. I have seen young men to be a fantastic leader. Yes, are we getting there? Are we complete? No, education is quality. It doesn't, you cannot just give any kind of education. You have to provide quality of education. Quality of education, that means you produce critical thinking for those people. Try to help them to do critical thinking. Help them to ask questions. Help them to be able to take the floor and speak up. Know how to communicate. Teach them something that they can come and share and be uh, with their colleagues together in the same environment and be seen as equal, not seen as different. That is the issue that we are working. EIL has been developed a curriculum right now that even the schools are closed right now. From seven to 12th grade, schools are closed all over Afghanistan. Everybody knows that. But you know that for two months, we work on a curriculum, we decided, we must keep the door of a school open. And how we do? We develop academy merit. It means that we develop a curriculum and we have a TV station. And from our TV station, we broadcast everyday classes, science, social science, every subject. And every child who can have a, um, uh, a TV, they can sit in front of the TV and watch that. And every child that who can really be able to get this, through their community, from community center, they can see that through community center, a TV is sitting there and will teach them how to read and write. Is that is the right things? Is that is replacing a school? No, of course not. If a school is a different environment, and psychologically, it's a school is some environment that the children all come together and they learn and they will learn. But these things, at least in emergency situation, I just want to share with you that women have been in front point all the time. I see in my own eyes, a woman who suffered, a woman who was sick, a woman who was poor, a woman who nobody could reach for them. But you know what? The woman provides service to them. During the pandemic, during the quit, our people, many local organizations, they were the one who really saved life. They were the one that do, do humanitarian work. They were the one who reach out. They are all women. They prove it to the world that the women are the best leader providing service to this kind of emergency, this kind of pandemic, this kind of issue. Right now, the women are doing a fantastic job in Afghanistan. I, I praise them. I praise them. I am proud of them that they are not afraid. They are going in front line and they are doing their task. Yes, they're supposed to not to work but they are wearing this hijab. Hijab is not bothering them. They wear a mask, but they go and they talk. We have a journalist right now working in with our TV station. They go in front and they give their presentation. We have a doctor who goes in front of the TV and give prevention to the different diseases. Do you know that EOL expand their program? We expanded during this last year. Why? Because there was a great need. Did we have a financial situation stable? No. Are we lacking finance? Yes. The other colleagues from the UN says that the money is the most important thing right now. The money has been frozen for Afghanistan. Afghanistan doesn't have the money. Who is suffering from that? Are the government suffering from that? No, the people of Afghanistan are suffering. The people of Afghanistan need that money to get to them because the service is um, needed. Right now, EOL open three more new clinics, five more new centers. Why? Because there is not enough service available in Afghanistan. And AIL doing anything that they could do to go around and be able to provide service. Yes, we have a situation, a tough situation, but we are not giving up. 
We constantly work on that. And Anivi, as an entrepreneur, as a social entrepreneur, with my colleagues, we learn how to be creative. And being creative means that you look at the condition and you act on it and you act any way that you can, you get your objective and that's what we are doing. And ideally, yeah. I think- I uh, think yeah, I'm that's, that's really great. I, uh, due to time constraint, I would like you to give your final thoughts just to conclude uh, your, um, your speech and your message to everybody. Thank you. I really appreciate the beginning. I didn't talk, so I can have another more minute. My point is that as a woman, I really think that the women of Afghanistan or the women of anywhere in the world, they have a great opportunity to they become united together. Don't have a um, uh, sort of a, a jealousy toward each other, especially women who have a, get into a position, then they look down to the other women. They should share, they should be generous. And also through the education, we must be able to teach them love, wisdom, and really unity. Because if we teach this through our educational system, there is not going to be a uh, sort of inequality. Because once you are good, you learn, then you do good things, then people will be happy. When you love and that love reach to each other and they know that you mean that. So goodness come out of that. So my point is that through your educational system, make sure that as um, Dr. Ju Moon says that, Dr. Julia Moon says that, that we teach this pillar of life, which is love, unity, wisdom, and caring and providing humanitarian service. Providing humanitarian service in a way, in any kind of way that you could, doesn't mean that you just only provide food or clothing, also to do all kinds of acting, you can provide humanitarian acts, to reach out for those individuals that are unreachable. And that is my final point, that I really think that this, there would be no peace without women. That is really true. No matter what women are doing, a mother knows how she feels about her child. And that is the way we are working on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to say the truth, we could say not uh, half an hour, one hour, but uh, several hours really to discuss about the importance of peace, the importance of conflict resolution. And as you mentioned, education is uh, beyond everything. Education, um, how you ex describe, I, could ever, I couldn't ever describe better. It's kind of a saying that education is life per se, and we can see uh, with for what you have been talking, for what we have been seeing um, uh, outside, how devastating is to build up a state, how devastating and how um, uh, dangerous and um, is to live in that kind of situation that you are working there with Afghanistan, and how much important is the peace and uh, the conflict of resolution if we want to have growth, if we have, uh, if we want to have um, health um, uh, services. If we have, if you want to have, um, I don't know, uh, building up uh, trade and other communication as well. So thank you for uh, very, very much for sharing this excellent experience with us. And um, I would like to give uh, uh, more floor to you, but uh, due to time constraint, uh, I need to uh, close this panel, saying that um, basically the cost of war and the cost of um, conflict are very much higher, not simply directly because they are um, they are ruining and uh, destroying kind of a public infrastructure or factories or machineries, but uh, biggest is the indirect cost uh, living in a war or indirect cost of having a conflict because the population displacement, displacement because of reduce of, um, uh, of production, poor health services or poor education services, uh, lower current and future physical investments, reduction in educational opportunities, brain drains, etc. And the importance of uh, women into all this conflict resolution and peace is very much important because uh, as you perfectly mentioned, all of you that it's not about the woman or, um, or men, so dealing with gender, but it's about how you are feeling and what you are giving mostly to the uh, resolution of the conflicts, to the peace and the promoting development as well. I would like to thank you all of uh, all of you for the participation and for the input. I would like to thank you to thank even Mr. Lanson that 
he's not with us, uh, but hopefully he, he, he is hearing us. Thank you very much. And I would like to give the floor uh, to the second panel. And I'm really thrilled and uh, happy to see what will come in the second panel as well. So thank you very much.